There's a new award-winning four-grain straight bourbon whiskey that's been taking the market by storm, Penelope Bourbon. Penelope's balanced yet flavorful taste profile comes from a unique blend of three bourbon mash bills. Currently available in three expressions, four grain, barrel strength, and toasted, Penelope is remarkably smooth and flavorful. So whether you're sipping neat or using it in your favorite cocktail, Penelope's perfect for you. Penelope Bourbon is available in select markets as well as online at PenelopeBourbon.com. In 2014, director Doug Lyman and star Tom Cruise gave the world an explosive sci-fi masterpiece of action cinema. In 2022, Brad, we, we try it again for some reason. For some odd reason, we're back. The film is Edge of Tomorrow. The whiskey is Basil Hayden's Caribbean Reserve Rye. And we'll review them both. This is the, the Film, film and, and Whiskey Podcast. Welcome to the Film and Whiskey Podcast, where each week we review a classic movie and a glass of whiskey. I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And this week we are looking at the 2014 film Edge of Tomorrow. Brad, when we planned out our season five lists, there were a couple movies that were kind of crossovers. And we've mentioned this before. I think About Time was one of them. It was a movie that we both wanted to have represented somewhere on our lists. We did it again last week with Up in the Air. And then this week, I remember talking about Edge of Tomorrow and just being so happy that you wanted to lean into this one on your list. Yeah, Bob, this is one of those action movies that for me, I hadn't ever heard much about. I honestly don't even know if I saw it in theaters. Uh, like, I'm I'm not sure if I actually saw it, but I will say 100%, this is one of my favorite action movies of all time. It's so good. And like, I remember, I, like, I, I did go to see it in the theater, and I think the only thing that really swayed me to go see it was seeing how many reviews just said, it's so much fun. It's a fun movie. And I was like, I was in a, I don't know what was going on this year, 2014, but I was wanting to see fun movies because this is the same year that chef came out and that's you know that's a feel-good movie again and tom cruise had just had a movie the year before this with a very similar premise called oblivion where like he ends up fighting like a giant computer at the end of the movie and it's a futuristic desolate wasteland and that movie was very beautiful to look at but it was so boring and i didn't yep. like it at all and this yep. movie comes out and i was like oh he's doing the exact same movie again. There's no way I'm going to go see that. And all of a sudden I see that it has like 90% positive ratings and all the critics are saying, you got to check this out. It's so much fun. And Brad, I'm so happy that I did because this was just, I mean, I was like a little kid in the movie theater, but just grinning yeah. the whole time. You know what it is, Bob? I, I remembered. Do you know what 2014 was? Uh, it's, what was it's, it? It's the year that you were getting married. So oh, like, there it is. Wow, man, my wife is going to be so mad at me for forgetting what year we got married. Yeah. But you're right. I was just in a happy mood, you know? Just looking for good, uplifting things to watch. And if there's ever an uplifting film, it's Edge of Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I, I imagine that some people will not have seen this movie. Although, like a lot of movies this season, I feel like this really took on a second life. <laughs> Get it? It took on a second Ooh. life, Brad? Uh, 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 I see what you did there. Hey. But seriously, I, like there's been a few movies in the last, you know, decade plus, especially in the action genre that don't perform super well in the theater. And then they find another life on Netflix or whatever. Uh, there's a movie a few years back called Den of Thieves that really uh, kind of latched on. Um, and this is another one like that where. It made good money at the box office. I think it made like $300 million, but it was pretty much just a break even for Warner Brothers. And so it wasn't really considered that much of a hit. But then people started checking it out and realized, oh, my gosh, like the premise of this movie is what if we combined Groundhog Day with an alien invasion? And it is like you cannot get a better premise for a movie than that. Yeah, I was going to say, Bob, I don't know if I actually need to do Brad Explains today because I, I think you just did it. <laughs> I, I definitely gave the three second version of it. You know what? Well, just for, for old time's sake, 
you know, for sentimental reasons. Let's do Brad Explains. This is the part of the podcast where Brad breaks down the plot of the film that he has just seen, often for the first time. Brad, this was obviously not your first time seeing Edge of Tomorrow, but can you give us just a short overview of the characters, the basic plot of the movie? Yeah, what if you took Groundhog Day and uh, turned it into an action movie, Bob? <laughs> Edge of Tomorrow is about a uh, American Army major um, named Nicholas Cage, I think. Uh, I think is it Bill Cage? Is it yeah, Bill? it is. Uh, William. William Cage. They keep calling him Bill, and I'm like, you're not a Bill. You're Tom <laughs> no, <he's>... Cruise. A hundred percent. Yeah. Major Cage is sent into the front lines of an invasion of the beaches of Normandy to fight the alien threat that has invaded the world. Uh, He is killed by a special type of alien enemy, and he finds himself reliving the same day over and over. He builds a friendship and uh, partnership with Rita Vertasky, who is a female soldier that also experienced the same thing at an earlier battle. And their goal is to find the Overmind, the the Hive Lord, whatever it's called, and destroy it. <laughs> and it's awesome. And it, it just kicks ass, Bob. Yep. It's just, it's it's, just it, a it, good... Truly, this movie just kicks so much ass, dude. It does. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brad, we are going to get a little bit deeper into our analysis about how this movie kicks ass. But before we get there, let's just go ahead and give a quick plug here. If this is your first time listening to the podcast or if you're a longtime listener and you want to support the podcast a little bit more, we'd really appreciate it if you check out our Patreon. We have three different tiers of membership starting at only three dollars a month. You get a ton of bonus perks, including access to a special discord channel. You get bonus episodes that are only for Patreon members. You get uncensored episodes, so you don't have to hear me and Brad bleeped all the time. So if that appeals to you at all, as it does to me, go ahead and check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash film whiskey. Bob, let's get let's get talking about this movie. Where do you want to start? Because I think that with action movies, you know, a lot of times I think you can kind of put acting on a slightly different level. Uh, than you would a drama or, or other types of movies. But I, I personally think the acting is out of this world in this movie. So we, we could start there. We could start with the cinematography. We could start with the action scenes. Like, wh- like what about this movie really gets your juice flowing? Well, I guess I want to I want to start with a question to you, Brad, because I am not really a video game player. I just not, like growing up, we never had the newest version. So like when everyone else had an N64, we had a Super Nintendo and then everyone moved on to GameCube. And I was like, yeah, a used N64. You know what I mean? So <laughs> I've, I've always been behind the curve. This movie seems like it would really appeal to a first game or a first person shooter oriented video game fan, but it's not shot like a first person shooter. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think you really could have taken this concept and run with it where tons of it was POV shots from Tom Cruise's point of view. And yet they don't quite do it like that. So, I mean, you have a little bit more experience gaming than I do. What would you make of this movie? Like, do you think it would appeal to video game fans or is it is it too cinematic? I mean, if you really wanted to to go back to the beautiful masterpiece of first person cinema, go watch Doom. It's got The Rock. Uh, it's you know, it's got Rosamund Pike. I, I thought you said it's, Dune, like the yeah. the new movie, and I was like, no, it yeah, doesn't. No. <laughs> it doesn't have the no. what you're talking about. Doom came out in 2005, based on the f- wildly popular video game from the 90s, yeah. Doom. Yep, and it was terrible. Why, uh, why have we not it, gotten a Duke Nukem movie? Oh, dude. That's that, what we need. That's what the world needs right now. <laughs> I think Rocky Four is the Duke Nukem. <laughs> <laughs> Just all a pro-America. Oh, man. Man, I think that for me as somebody who has played a massive amount of video games in my life, it feels like there are other movies that have been marketed more towards the gaming audience um, whether it's like something like World of Warcraft, which is literally a movie based off the the video game, or things like uh, like is it Gamer? I want to say with uh, with Gerard Butler, you know, movies like that I think are like very clearly made for video game mm-hmm, audiences. Mm-hmm. I don't feel that way about Edge of Tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, so if we wanted to sound snooty about Edge of Tomorrow, like it's a it's an originally made movie. 
but like the whole premise of the movie is is derivative, right? Like if you wanted to give the movie a compliment, you would say like, oh, this is Groundhog Day as an action movie, which we did. And because we like the movie, if you wanted to be mean about it, I think you would say like the reason this movie exists is is to appeal to like a video game culture where you get killed, you respawn, you try again. And I really love that the filmmakers and Doug Liman especially doesn't they don't lean into like the respawning aspect of this movie as if it's a video game. They lean into it more of the, you know, it's it's a lot like Bill Murray's movie Groundhog Day, where you watch Tom Cruise try and try again and fail and get frustrated and get depressed for a while and kind of give up for a while and finally overcome this thing that he's stuck in. And I, I love that they go that route more than just the like. I'm going to respawn and be a first person shooter again. Well, the beauty of this movie is really the development of Cage as a character Mm -hmm. that he moves from being a coward into being a a true hero, right? Self-sacrificing for the the betterment of humanity to to defeat this mimic threat. General, this isn't the first time we've had this conversation. That's that's. Because you're you're stubborn. You won't believe me when I tell you that Dr. Carter was right, that the enemy can manipulate time. The invasion will fail, no matter how many bodies you throw at it. The only way to win this war is by finding this power source of the mimic horde and killing it. And the only means of finding it is in that safe right there. No matter how many times we have this conversation, you refuse to accept that the enemy breaks through to London tomorrow and we lose, we lose everything. That like, that's the ultimate transformation. It, it, he really kind of goes through the hero's journey in a lot of ways, yeah. right? Like he starts off as a coward. He gains a special ability, almost a magical boon from the gods. And then he finds a mentor, someone to apprentice him and bring him along. Mm -hmm. And then he goes through trial after trial after trial over and over again, hundreds, thousands of times. And, you know, whereas Groundhog Day uses like Bill Murray becomes um, a master pianist or, you know, he, he works on all these different talents and abilities with an action movie. What I really love about it is that. There are there are no talents and abilities that matter outside killing the mimics. <laughs> I, you know what I mean? Like that is his thing that he needs to spend ten thousand hours at. I would have been cool with the side quest where Tom Cruise just becomes a master pianist, though. Just for you know what I mean, <laughs> just for the heck of it. I mean, he does go to the bar and and have a have a warm beer at some point. That's so, true. You know, that's there, true. There is that. <laughs> All right. So for those who haven't seen this movie, I, I want to get a, just a little bit more granular with what the plot of the film is. So there is an alien invasion happening and they call these things mimics, the aliens. They kind of come up out of the ground and they are like giant, uh, quickly moving tumbleweeds that have tons of they're like a, a combination of like a spider and a tumbleweed. They have so many legs they can just kind of roll at you and then they just, you know, they rip you to shreds. I, I think it would kind of be like if Stitch had like 50 arms <laughs> from Lilo and Stitch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, basically. And they have like these these orange glowing mouths and, you know, they're really hard to kill. So a combination of countries armies are staging an offensive at some beach against them. And when not, Tom not, Cruise is not some beach, Bob, N- the beaches of Normandy. Is it really Normandy? I must have. It I must is. have missed that. OK. Yeah. So and when Tom Cruise is dropped pretty unceremoniously into <laughs> into this mix, he is taken out by a mimic that has a blue glowing mouth. And it turns out these are called alphas. And there's only about one in every six million mimics. And something happens that when you kill that mimic and when its blood gets on you. It uh, it somehow affects you in that, like, those things are manipulated by time. And now Tom Cruise is manipulated by time and he keeps living the same day over and over again. You find out eventually, like Brad said, that there is like a, a mothership kind of creature called the Omega that uses this time travel manipulation to defeat the enemy, to create a, a perfect situation where they can't lose. And so Tom Cruise has to figure out a way to get to the Omega and kill it before it outsmarts him and wins a victory. And Brad, like, it's a really interesting concept for a movie 
But I got to say, like, if there is one knock against the movie, it's that it's so high concept with its like respawning time travel, hunting for the Omega plot that I feel like the creature design and like the threatening nature of the mimics was really underdeveloped. Like, I never really understood the mimics at all. I guess for me, I, I don't really have any reason to understand them. Like, the explanation that they give in the movie is simply that these are world-conquering organisms. And I really, like, when Tom Cruise is at the, at the pub and these older guys are, like, arguing about whether they want oxygen or minerals or something, like, Tom Cruise points out, he just says, it, it doesn't matter what they're sure, here for. Sure. They're here for all of it and none of it. Like, who knows? What's important is that we're going to lose. <laughs> So like, like here's my question like they're like, going to get it. So they find out eventually that the the Omega is like in the parking garage or something of the Louvre, like it's underneath the Louvre hiding out. And they fly like a like a helicopter to the Louvre basically. And as they're approaching it, all of the mimics that are protecting the Omega start firing on the helicopter. And my question is like what are they shooting? Are they shooting guns? Are they is is what they're shooting coming out of their mouths? Like they never like you never really get an explanation of how these things function. I, I'm completely with you that it doesn't really matter what they're here for. They're a threat. But like I didn't even really understand how they fight because in most of yeah. the combat sequences, they just kind of roll at you and then they rip you apart with their arms. So like what's their firepower? Did they did they bring some weird space guns with them? Like I. I wish they would have just given even 30 seconds more explanation. I mean, I I don't know if this is like being pedantic. It, it might be. But like there is a like literally a four second shot of like the entire beach more from like the land side than the water side. And you actually see like in the ground bigger mimics almost like shooting artillery. These big explosive energy beams that like arc over their troops and onto the you okay. know, invading human forces. All so right, I, don't, cool. I don't know if I'm with you in the fact that I think the mimics are fascinating and I want to know more about how they work. But part of that is like I, I feel like that's the whole idea. Like we're not going to tell you about how they work. So you're curious. So you mm -hmm. want to know more. I, I don't yeah. Know. And you're right in that. Like ultimately it doesn't matter. But I think. It's the little things like that that are going to keep this movie from being a 10 out of 10 to me. It is enjoyable as hell, and I really loved watching this movie. But I do feel like there are a few things that, that could have been tweaked, and it would have made it even better for me. Well, I guess then, what do, what do you think about the World War II of it all? Mm. Like, the movie is, is, is very obviously set up as a alternate world... World War II simulator where like, you know, the meteor lands in Germany and they they invade France and they move on from there. Like th the whole movie is set up as like them fighting back the Nazi threat. Mm -hmm. But this time it's aliens. Like, mm -hmm. did that bother you at all? Was it did it? No, feel... it didn't bother me at all. But I also don't I don't think there's anything deeper to it. You know what I mean? Like, I I think they just. Honestly, I think it's probably more a matter of like convenience in telling the story because we're all so familiar with the uh, the history of battles in World War Two and how that spread out across the continent and where the important battles were that it just kind of makes sense. Like, oh, yeah, they're on the beaches of Normandy. So, of course, they would fight on the beaches of Normandy. And of course, you know, France and Germany are going to be in conflict and France is going to get taken over immediately. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it's just and I, but I will say that. And this is like getting completely down a rabbit hole. Isn't it funny, though, that these kind of movies, especially movies that are made in America, they never really have the invasion happening on American soil. Like the yeah. only one I can think of is Independence Day, you know, and I guess kind of signs. But even in those movies, it's a worldwide invasion. It's not like they're concentrated here. And I think that it's it's really interesting that Americans don't like to think of their country as a place that could be a theater for war, but we're so used to seeing it in Europe that it's like, oh, yeah, of course, they would land in, in Paris. You know what I mean? Yeah, oh, obviously, Bob. No, I'm with you, dude. I think that's an interesting point. I think that the reality of history is that there's been no major ground war in the United States of America outside the Civil War. Right. And so our our public conscience doesn't 
Like when a writer goes to write a movie, he doesn't even think about the idea that you would have a war in America. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I'm with you, dude. That's interesting. All right, Brad, let's talk briefly about the performances here. Tom Cruise is criminally underrated for what he does. And if you follow the career trajectory of Tom Cruise, like very early on, he started trying to make movies that would get him, you know, critical and and awards attention. He made a movie in 1989 called Born on the Fourth of July with Oliver Stone, for which he was nominated for an Oscar. And he's really good in that movie. And I think all through the 90s, he kept trying stuff like this. He would alternate between being the biggest movie star in the world and then trying something new. He made a movie with Paul Thomas Anderson called Magnolia, where he was nominated for an Oscar. He was in a Stanley Kubrick movie, Eyes Wide Shut. Like, he tries this stuff, and I think at a certain point he realizes the Academy is just never going to give me the recognition as an actor. <laughs> and, and instead so, of going the Leo route and, like, like yeah. dragging himself through the mud to try and earn one, right. he's just like, F it, I'm going to make big, awesome box office thrillers that people love. Yeah, but so here's the thing is that I, I really respect the way he's done it because a lot of people do that, right? Like, you know, every once in a while in the mid 2000s, like Dwayne The Rock Johnson would try something that was a serious acting performance. Like he did a football movie called Gridiron Gang. And, you know, he didn't he didn't get anywhere with that. So now he's like, I'm going to be in Fast and Furious 11, you know, and Mark <laughs> Wahlberg gets nominated for The Departed. That goes nowhere. And he's like, all right, like I'm I'm in my 50s now. I'm just going to make dumb action movies with Tom Holland. But Tom Cruise, like he stays a movie star, but he also he also constructs the Mission Impossible franchise around himself in such a way that it's like I am going to do something that movie stars have never done on screen. And he really has become a master at the stuff that he's doing on screen. It's it's kind of insane. Some of the stunts that he's doing and learning how to fly a helicopter for a movie so that they can get more realistic shots. Like, I honestly, I'm, a, I'm of the opinion that if the Academy is going to be a sucker for method acting, like, quote unquote, you know, someone gains 40 mm, pounds and learns how yeah. to be a boxer or whatever. What's more method? Than Tom Cruise learning how to fly an effing helicopter upside down for a Mission Impossible. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, where it, the lines seem so arbitrary. And this guy is really doing things we've never seen before to get our butts in the seats. And I really wish he would get the recognition he deserves for it. Dude, you are preaching to the choir. Uh, if you noticed, I put two Tom Cruise movies in my selection uh, of 15. And it's because I freaking love Tom Cruise. I, I think he is one of our greatest actors of all time, like not just of this generation. Like, I think he is so brilliant at what he does. It's rare to see someone so dedicated to their craft. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, like uh, you see all these videos about Kobe Bryant and like how he outworked people, how, you know, somebody be like, oh, I was on the Olympic team and I showed up at like 430 in the morning to to get a workout in and Kobe was already drenched in sweat, right? Yeah. Like Tom Cruise is the Kobe Bryant equivalent in the world of acting. <laughs> and I don't think, you know, I don't think Tom Cruise is the greatest actor of all time. I, no. I, I, I know that he has his limitations, but I think it's honestly movies like this where you see him instead of being the uber competent, like hyper aware, action star you see him he is just uh, honestly he's back to his days of uh uh what's the one where he's a sports agent jerry Maguire. Mm -hmm. like he's back to his jerry Maguire days he's sleazy he's charming he's like he literally says it at the very start he he tells uh brendan gleason like he goes look I, i'm i'm not a an action person i'm not here to see the front lines i'm a marketer i'm an i'm an advertiser like I'm here to make you look good. Let's talk about a book deal. Let's talk about all this stuff. And so to see him then thrown into combat where he's unaware of his surroundings, he's unable to figure out how to get his gun off of its safety. He's just utterly incompetent. And to see him grow into the competency, I think this is one of his best performances of the last 10 or 15 years. Yeah, totally agree, man. Like and I, and and I don't have much more to say other than you know, I, I'm with you in that I think he's a more limited actor than some of these other movie stars we have. Like when he tries drama, he's pretty good. 
but he's not like transcendently good. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And so because of that, he stays in a very specific lane. But I guess what what I want to keep pointing out is the hypocrisy of like a guy who stays in his lane because he knows that's all he can do doesn't get the respect of a guy like Leo, who I think if we're being frank about Leo can do more than he actually does, Mm -hmm. but knows like I can I can hit I can go 10 for 10 from the field playing this like emotionally wounded man in every movie. Do you know what I'm saying? And like we give Leo an Oscar for doing that. We don't give an Oscar to Tom Cruise because we're like, oh, he can't do anymore. But functionally, they're like the same thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. no, it's staying in your lane. And like, I think Jack Nicholson has branched out more than just this. But like his lane is anger. He he does anger better than anyone else. Mm-hmm. And he has gotten multiple Oscars for that. Yeah. So like, with, like, you know, Leo only got one for playing what the Academy normally loves, the emotionally wounded, vulnerable person. Uh, but I'm with you, dude. Where's the love for my boy, Tommy Cruz? All right, man. Before we get to break, let's talk Emily Blunt. Uh, and here's all I'm going to say about her. She's fantastic in everything she does. And I am a supporter for life. Yep. You know? Yeah. I'm a hundred percent with you, man. I, she, I think that her role in this movie is so difficult because she starts off in this place of just emotional, bitterness and she has like walls that are a hundred feet high up around her heart. And I can't imagine playing a role where the goal is to become more, uh, emotionally open to your co-star Tom Cruise. But the whole plot of the movie is that she doesn't remember everything that's happened. Yeah. It's a very, it's a very 51st dates kind of, kind of scenario. And I think I think she does a really great job with it. Mm-hmm. I, I think the moment where he offers her coffee and she says thank you, like, and then slowly realizes that he's done this before mm-hmm. and the walls go back up. You can fly it, can't you? No. Well, yes. I mean, I can take off. I'm still working on my landing. What are we still doing here? You're wasting time. Rita, if you start that engine, you die. It's as far as you go. No matter what I do. It's as far as you ever make it. I don't know, man. There's just a lot of moments like that where I think that Emily Blunt was handed a very thankless job. And I think she knocked it out of the park. So, Brad, here's the crazy thing. I was just looking up Emily Blunt on IMDb. She's never been nominated for an Oscar. And I could have sworn she was up for like at least two. Right. She's been so good since she really burst on the scene with The Devil Wears Prada was like her breakout role. And she's so good in that. And then, you know, like all the way through Sicario and this movie and the Quiet Place movies. Have you seen either of the Quiet Place movies? No, I haven't. Dude, that that is the kind of like horror thriller movie I love. It's very much influenced by Signs, where there's like a very strong family dynamic. But it's horror in that like it's fun to eat popcorn while watching this movie. Like it's not going to keep you up at night, but it's like a th- it, it makes you jump a couple times and you walk out like, wow, that was really good. And and she's so, so good in those movies. I yeah, man, I'm I'm all in on Emily Blunt. I'm a little bit pissed to find that she's never been up for an Oscar before. Yeah, dude, get Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt an Oscar <laughs> together. A joint uh, yes. a joint Oscar for <laughs> Edge of Tomorrow eight years later. <laughs> yes, I'm in, dude. <laughs> All right, man. Hey, while we're riding these uh, positive waves for this movie, let's try to take this into the Basil Hayden Caribbean Reserve Rye. What do you say? Bob, I don't want to. Can, can we just talk? <laughs> can we keep talking about Emily Blunt or Tom Cruise or the stunts that he does? Like, I just want to talk about anything else. Yep. All right. Well. We're still going to Basil Hayden, so prepare yourself. Uh, All right, dude. All right. Today we are checking out Basil Hayden's Caribbean Reserve Rye. And Brad, I honestly can't think of a better brand to pair with Edge of Tomorrow because it feels like I am reliving my nightmare over and over again. Uh, (laughs) If we ever do Groundhog Day... We'll yeah. have to pair another basil another Hayden basil with it. Hayden with it. <laughs> we we did basil Hayden's bourbon, the you know the standard one back in season one. We waited all the way till season five to try something else, and just a few weeks ago we tried basil Hayden's dark rye, which we did not like, and now we're trying basil Hayden's Caribbean Reserve. Now this rye 
is like the dark rye. It's actually considered a distilled spirits specialty because it's a blend of Kentucky straight rye and four year old Canadian whiskey with black strap rum. So they're like mixing rum directly into the product. It's not finished in rum. It is a combination of whiskey and rum, which Bob, like, I'm, I'm sure it's just a touch. I'm sure it's a touch, man. <laughs> I guess like here's the thing. I don't want to be snooty. I don't want to be exclusive or elitist on this show because on it, like what we try to do here is review something that you are going to see on the shelves of your local liquor store. But I feel like Basil Hayden's Brad is really stretching and pushing the envelope of like what I'm willing to review anymore because it's whiskey, but it's not really whiskey anymore. And at this point, it's like, well, why the hell don't we just do fireball? You know what I mean? Yeah. I Listen, man. Even if they would, if they were willing to put it out at 90 proof, <laughs> like I think that there might be an increase in quality. But when you're, when you're mixing other spirits in with your whiskey, at this point, it's just a mixed drink. Like, I, like I think if they advertise this, like, you know how like some people do like old fashioned in a bottle, uh, I, you know, like uh, one of our favorite distilleries, Watershed, puts out a product like that and it's really, really good. Tastes like an old fashioned in a bottle. Mm -hmm. At this point, this is just a it's a mixed drink. It's it's not whiskey. Yeah. And even like the kind of rum they're using here is called blackstrap rum, which apparently is like a, a really controversial thing in the world of rum. It's it's basically black rum. Um, and traditionally, like it's said to be made from blackstrap molasses, but it doesn't have to be. You can just call any really dark rum blackstrap rum and get away with it. So like it seems very on brand for Basil Hayden's, if I'm being honest. <laughs> like out of all the rums, they're not using Kraken. They're they're not even using like Captain Morgan's or anything. <laughs> so let's let's give this a nosing, man. And and as I as I nose this, it actually smells really really nice. If I'm being honest, I mean, yeah, it's not bad. It's got like brown sugar, maple syrup. To me, it still just has Basil Hayden's has a has a specific kind of fake sweet nose to it. Mm -hmm. And I realized as I was smelling this that it smells like IHOP pancake syrup. Dude, I do you know what I was just going to say? <laughs> it smells like pancakes with like blueberry compote on it. Mm -hmm. yep. There's like a blueberry note on this. I have no idea where it's coming from. But when you push past the rum influence into the whiskey influence, it's really grain forward. And I feel like they're covering yep. that up with what smells like a delicious stack of pancakes. Yeah. Yeah, so like, you know, the smell is like decent. I'll give it a six out of ten. I'm gonna sure. give it a seven because I love blueberries and I love pancakes and like <laughs> we're recording at not even eleven o'clock in the morning and I'm like, oh, I should have late breakfast after this. It it is a breakfast whiskey at the very least. <laughs> a breakfast <laughs> whiskey. <laughs> All right, man. Let's give it a sip. Man, Bob, this is what like do, when we were drinking the Glen Livets. And they had a Caribbean Reserve, and I, I don't even remember the other one. The big thing we always said was that, like, the flavor, the aroma promised something, and then there was just water on the taste. This is even worse than that. Like, it literally is taste to me like watered down syrup. Mm. And I don't like that. I don't want to drink that. I don't want to think about that being whiskey. Uh, th there is some flavor there. So, you know, it tastes like watered down syrup. I'll give them that. Uh, I'll give it a three out of 10 on the taste. Holy crap. No, I. So here's the thing. I really prefer this flavor than uh, to the uh, the dark rye we did a few weeks ago. Like this is infinitely more complex. And like I really love there's a, there's still a little bit of that blueberry, almost like a pruny note on this, which I really, really like. But I think the rum kind of takes over after a while. It tastes more like yep. rum than it does whiskey, which is fine. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to sound like such a pretentious person on this, but like this is a whiskey podcast and I feel like they are really trying to stretch the definition of what can be called whiskey and they're selling it under a whiskey label and it's not really whiskey. And so like objectively, I don't mind this, Brad, like seriously, yep. I like it a lot better than you do. But when we're judging it based on the criteria of a whiskey I don't know, man. I'm going to give it a six out of 10 on the on the taste. I actually think it's a better taste than that. But like, it's just not a whiskey taste. Yeah. Well, and that for me, that's why I gave it a three out of 10. Like, it, it really doesn't taste like whiskey and, and it tastes OK. 
Uh, the, the finish comes along a little bit better. And I think the reason I like the finish more than the taste is because it, it feels like I just took a sip of like a cheap rum mm-hmm. and I'm like, you know, rum's good. It's very sugary. It's, it's based on cane sugar. So like, yeah, you know, if, if I'm having a sip of cheap rum, that's really nice. Yeah. I'll, I enjoy that. But then I think to myself, oh, wait, I, I didn't pour myself cheap rum. I poured myself $45 bottle of whiskey. Four out of 10 on the finish. Yeah. Once again, I'll give it a six out of 10 on the finish. We didn't really talk about the mouthfeel other than you said it was like watered down syrup. It's really, really thin. Yeah. I would I would like to try this even at 90 proof. I think it would be infinitely more complex. It's a it's a pleasing finish. It's just not whiskey. Yeah. So, yeah, I'll give it a six just to kind of balance out your four. And that takes us into overall balance. I think this might be the best balanced basil hayden's product we've had brad yeah it it actually it gives you what it promises uh, like through and through and that's what we talk about all the time when it comes down to balance like is it a is it a smooth ride and even if it's like super complex like does the complexity fit within itself and so for balance here i once again i'm gonna knock off a few points because it doesn't taste like whiskey i'll give it a six out of ten on the balance I think maybe the way that I'm approaching this is like you are doing a really good job of representing it as like not a whiskey. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. No, 100 percent. And I'm I'm going to go and just kind of review it as taking it for what it is at face value. And on that, like, I think it's about a seven and a half on balance. It's a really well balanced product. And I am still pissed at it for being what it is. <laughs> but but like, I can't knock the fact that it's well made. And that's the first time I'll say that and probably the last time I'll say that about a Basil Hayden's product. Uh, And that brings us to value. Now, in the state of Ohio, Brad, how much is this going to set you back? Forty four dollars and ninety nine cents. If you know what you're getting into, I don't think this is an awful value. And even compared to the other Basil Hayden's, this is the best one I've had yet. So like forty four dollars is too much for this, especially at 80 proof. Like, I would think like $33 would be significantly better. Yeah, I don't know, man. I'm going to give it a, I'm going to give it a five and a half on value. Here's the thing. I, I agree with you. I liked this more than I liked the dark rye we had a few weeks ago, but that at least tasted like a whiskey. Mm-hmm. And, and like, for me, that like weirdly gives it a step up, even though it tastes worse than this, uh, on based on principle alone. I'm going to give this a one out of 10 on value because (laughs) you're not buying whiskey here. Like if you said, would you consider paying $45 for this whiskey? And then you handed me rum. I'd be like, well, no, I'm, I wouldn't because that's not whiskey. Right. One out of 10 on value. Right. And that's kind of where I'm at with this. So I will say it sounds like you and I really understand each other's scoring metric here so like i wouldn't take this the the disparity in our scores as a sign that like i liked it and brad didn't i think we're just kind of trying to balance each other out in that it's a pretty good product but we're gonna deduct points for the fact that you are like kind of misleading people as to what this product actually is Mm -hmm. so my score i'm coming out to a 32 out of 50 brad what are you coming out to a 20 out of 50 yikes (laughs) <laughs> All right, so that puts us out to a 52 out of 100 or a 26 out of 50. Here's the interesting thing. I'm not going to recommend you buy, but I wouldn't say no to recommending people try this. Just know what you're getting into. Yeah. But it's not bad. Yeah. No, it, it's really not bad. I, for me, I, I will say the the taste, the mouthfeel genuinely was bad for me like like that was just not good i would rather drink a straight rum than this other than that the flavors are are interesting they're they're pleasurable they're they're not the worst thing in the world but like i I saw this comment on reddit talking about basil hayden's because i was honestly looking up basil hayden to be like are we just missing something does everybody hate basil hayden does everybody love basil hayden and we're just weird no, it seems like the whiskey world has has pretty much affirmed that Basil Hayden is not good. Uh, the best comment that I saw, though, and I think it it fits here, that th- like this is a whiskey that mostly tastes like rum, and it is the LaCroix of the whiskey world. <laughs> like, it's whiskey adjacent. Yeah, yeah. 
this really does fit into like the Seagram seven category of like they're blending neutral grain spirits into whiskey. This is this is very similar to that. So know what you're going into. It's not a bad experience, but it's just not really a whiskey. And that's where we're coming out on Basil Hayden's Caribbean Reserve Rye. Brad, let's get back to talking about something we like more than this. The movie Edge of Tomorrow. I can only imagine if we finished a movie review and, and we were like, you know, this isn't even really a movie. It's it's movie adjacent. <laughs> I should have said that about Sherlock. <laughs> you should have. <laughs> uh, let's get to it, Bob. All right. That was Caribbean Reserve Rye from Basil Hayden's and Brad. They're over three on this podcast. It yeah. is. Uh, it's not looking not looking too hot for Basil Hayden's as a brand. But we're getting back into talking about Edge of Tomorrow, a movie we both really like. And it's time for our new segment, Two Truths and a Falsehood. This is where two Brad... Facts. Two facts, Bob. Two fa- I'm sorry. I always forget the uh, the alliteration there. Two the facts and a falsehood. Brad picks, uh, you know, tidbits off of the internet that we really can't affirm are true anyway. But uh, we suppose two of them to be true and one of them to be false. And he's trying to stump me. Brad, I'm ready for you. It, we started out over one, and then I'm I'm on a streak here. I hit the last three, so I'm putting my hot streak on the line today. You sure are, Bob. Fact number one, the soldier that Emily Blunt punches, uh, the one who calls her the full metal, and then she punches him, uh-huh. is actually her younger brother, Sebastian Blunt. Hmm. Fact number two. The official name for this movie was changed from Edge of Tomorrow. That's what it was released as in the theaters. And then it had a disappointing U.S. box office, and they they hoped to, like, salvage some in DVD sales, and they changed the name to Live, Die, Repeat. Fact number three, Edge of Tomorrow is based on a book called All You Need Is Kill. This is a pretty easy one for me, Brad. This is uh, Number one is The Falsehood. And I was already thinking number one was the falsehood just because the name Sebastian Blunt sounded so made up that I was like, "Mm." (laughs) I'm going to go with number one. Bob, that is actually a truth. No, it's not. It 100% is. Google it right now. Emily Blunt brother, Sebastian Blunt. Wait a minute. So I know this. This was based on a book. Did you make up the name of the book? No, the name of the book is All You Need Is Kill. So you gave me three facts then. No, I did not. All right. Let's talk about this because I'm going to appeal on a technicality. I wanted I actually was going to segue out of my win into talking about the title of the movie. (laughs) So. So. So here's here's the thing. The the falsehood is that the official name of the movie was changed to live, die, repeat. It was not the the box that they use that they shipped it with. The change that they did make was that they yes. made the words live, live die, die repeat, repeat super big on the on the like cover of the box, right? And then at the bottom it said Edge of Tomorrow. Well, other distributors picked up on this and they started titling the movie mm-hmm. as Live Die Repeat mm-hmm. when the name was never actually changed. However, it is, it is Edge you, of Tomorrow. If I I agree because it pisses me off that they did that because people started talking about like, what's Live, Die, Repeat? And I'm like, oh, it's Edge of Tomorrow. And it confused a ton of people. However, if you look up the movie, like even on like the Wikipedia page, which I was just looking at before we started recording, it says that an alternate title for the movie is Live, Die, Repeat, colon, Edge of Tomorrow. So I took that to mean that it is an officially recognized alternative title for the movie. Man, in all of the research that I did, because I, I looked it up quite a few times, I did not find anywhere that they actually officially changed the title. Doug Lyman, the director, wanted it changed to Live, Die, Repeat, and he pissed off uh, one of the executives at, um, I think it's Warner Bros. Mm-hmm. That, that put it out. He he, like really he pushed so hard that he pissed off one of the executives and the executive was like, get the F out of here, Doug Lyman. It's edge of tomorrow. <laughs> All right. And listen, so, I'm going to say this. I I I am appealing on a technicality. I will not accept this as a defeat. How about this? How about we appeal it <laughs> on the discord? All right. We'll see what discord we'll, we'll says. put up a yeah. poll. We'll see if Bob was right or Brad was right. And they will decide your fate. All right. Because I was, I'm gonna say, like, regardless, that was a very, very nitpicky falsehood. 
Because I was aware of the title thing. Was it? I was aware of the title thing. Look at the Wikipedia Discord, and we'll settle this. Uh, If nothing else, we'll settle this in, you know, uh, a battle of fisticuffs. So. I I will say, though, you so confidently (laughs) I really thought I knew it, dude. I was like, (laughs) Sebastian Blunt, that's not a real person. (laughs) That's a fake name. (laughs) Uh, It serves me right. All right, listen, Brad, I've talked enough about this movie because it's just a freaking fun action movie. Is it perfect? No. Um, and I think if we want to give a couple nitpicks in our final scores, we can. But let's let's give this thing some scores, man. Where are you coming out on this movie? Here's the thing, Bob. I, I think that this is like probably my fourth time watching the film. What struck me this time through, I think that this script is incredibly well written. I, I think that what really uh, draws this movie together is that hero's path, you know, the the hero's story that I talked about earlier, that you really get to see Tom Cruise in a role that he rarely plays a someone who is inept at everything he is being asked to do. You know, I I think that the cinematography in this movie is just phenomenal. Like it is, it is some of the best action sequences I've ever seen in a movie. I think that the movie is like surprisingly funny at a lot of parts. The, the only time that Tom Cruise dies and the camera stays after he dies is when he's trying to roll and get away from his troop who is doing push-ups and he 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 rolls underneath this car and you hear him scream and the rest of the troop is like, oh, and it's just it is just a brilliantly funny moment. I, I think I think Lyman knocked it out of the park here. I'm going to give it a nine and a half out of ten, Bob. I, this is a nearly perfect movie that I will come back to time and time again. I'm glad you gave it a nine and a half because I I think objectively, I think this is like a nine out of 10. So I want to give it an eight and a half out of 10 to balance it out. And and here's why. No, no here, listen, get out, listen, no, get out of here, man. Here's why. You, you here's, can... I love this movie. I think that watching it through this time, A, it kind of suffers from being watched on a TV as opposed to a big screen. Like... And I think that you talked about the cinematography, like the action sequences in this movie are very thrilling. But if there is one weakness that I would say Lyman has as an as a director of like a war movie, it's that I wasn't always super familiarized with the geography of the setting. Like he there's a lot of quick cuts. This movie could have really used a few more long takes in it than the quick cuts that they use. And especially as Cruz starts reliving the day over and over and over, and they kind of keep cutting to later and later moments in his attempts to get up the beach, you just kind of get plopped into a part of the beach that you're not familiar with. And so it, it gets kind of disorienting after a while. And that final assault on the Louvre at nighttime, there's not enough kind of contrast in the image for me to understand what's going on sometimes. It really became hard to follow. And, and visually, I had a hard time understanding where characters were, what was coming at them. So like there are some, I think, kind of fundamental flaws in the way this movie is filmed and cut together and the geography of some of those action sequences. I think you're right in that. Hold on. I'm not done. (laughs) I think you're right in saying that like for an action movie script, this is like a 10 out of 10. This is it's 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 a perfectly constructed movie. But there are just certain moments where I think sometimes Lyman is rushing to get to the punchline, even like the very last moment of the movie, right? Like Tom Cruise thinks he dies for real. And, you know, you find out that they won, but that he got the blood of the alpha on him again. And so he gets to wake up again. But now it's after they've defeated the enemy and he goes back to see Emily Blunt again. And she says, like, "Eh, who the hell are you, basically? And he kind of chuckles and it cuts to black. And it's it's a fun little punchline of an ending. But I thought it was kind of emblematic of the fact that there are many, many points in this movie where if they had just kind of let something hang in the air for a second or two longer, I think it would have helped the pacing a little bit. Sometimes it just felt rushed to me. So I don't think it's a perfect movie, but like I'm absolutely going to give it a recommendation. I just think it could have used a little bit more tightening up and I'm going to give it an eight and a half out of ten. Here's the thing, Bob. I, I am I'm with you. On all the observations you made about the movie, but but we need to talk business for the Film and Whiskey podcast for a second. 
Because if we're going to start giving scores with the idea that my score will balance our combined score out to what I really think the movie mm. is, then I'm going to give E.T. a 2 out of 10 <laughs> so that retroactively our, our, our combined score is a 6 out of 10. All right, that's 10. fair. All right, uh, you've convinced me. You, your appeal to E.T. has convinced me. I, I'll give it a 9 <laughs> because yes. I think it is like objectively like a 9 out of 10. So yeah. that, that takes our average out to a 9.25 out of 10. I'd like to hear what Film and Whiskey Nation thinks of this one. Have you seen Edge of Tomorrow? If you haven't, you really should. And I, I'd like you to tell us why not. Were you turned off by some other Tom Cruise movie? If you have seen it, what did you think of it? Do you agree with our score? You can find us on all of our social media accounts on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Film Whiskey. And I will say, I'm going to add to that, Bob, by saying... This is a movie you need to crank up. So if you have kids, send them to a baby, you know, to your friend's house for an evening and get as many friends as you can in the room. Blast the it is it needs to be a loud movie. And once you're done watching it with all of your friends, you need to jump on our discord and talk to us about it because we are on there every single day talking to who really are becoming our friends, people that we really care about. Uh, in the in Film and Whiskey Nation. So get on our Discord. You can find the link to it at the end of every one of our show notes. Brad, I've put my movies into the wheel spinner here to see what we're watching next week. And it is landing on... Oh, one of my favorite comedies of recent years. A movie that I don't know if you know anything about, so I'm not even going to say anything else about it. It's a movie from New Zealand called Hunt for the Wilder People. I'm super if it's from New Zealand, then it's Taika Waititi? It is Taika Waititi, yeah. Well, it's either him I, or Peter Jackson, so you had, yeah, had I, was, I was about to say. <laughs> Damn it. I didn't want to give away that it was Taika Waititi, because I know how much you love Jojo Rabbit. Oh, dude. I, you said New Zealand, and I was like, it's literally got to be him, right? It's oh, a man. comedy, so it's not Peter Jackson. Man, I, <laughs> ah, I'm mad at myself. All right, we're going to watch Taika Waititi's movie next week, but until then, I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And we'll see you next time. 